Welcome to Photoshop Rant. I'm Lee Veris, and I'm here to bring you tips and tricks for Photoshop teachers and students. Today's rant is about the Info Panel. This interface item is uh, one of the most useful tools available in Photoshop, but also one of the most underutilized. I will explore some of the ways you can use the Info Display to help you make decisions about how to proceed with image enhancements, and hopefully you'll gain some new appreciation for this humble old-school feature in Photoshop. So here in, uh, in Photoshop, we, uh, we have, I have a very simple image here just to talk about some of the features of the Info Panel, but as you can see over here in the upper right corner, I like to keep the info panel open at all times. Uh, now the info panel is very, very useful and it, I find it way more useful than the histogram. Now don't get me wrong, you know, the histogram is a useful feature, uh, but in Photoshop, um, as you can see, the histogram display here is just, you know, not all that particularly interesting when we have an uninteresting image. Now it is useful, I'm going to switch over to Lightroom here. Um, it's more useful, I think, in Lightroom because you can actually sort of interact with it. You can see as I move the cursor over the histogram, uh, it sort of lights up certain areas, get a little bit lighter gray. You can kind of see, and that highlights the slider that will control that particular area of the histogram. But you can also click in the histogram and um, for instance, let's, um, let's brighten up the shadows a little bit, but then darken the black point. And uh, we can also make the image over lighter overall just by clicking and dragging in the histogram. So in Lightroom, uh, just because the way the interface is set up for a more kind of less precise and more visual uh, kind of experience, um, the histogram is more useful in Lightroom. But now going back to Photoshop, uh, the your info panel gives you way more information than you can get from the histogram. So for instance, we are looking here at, uh, I think everyone would agree that we have sort of a gray field with a white field and a black field, um, these squares. Uh, and that's what it looks like. Um, but the info panel lets us know exactly how gray the gray is. So if I move my cursor over into the um, into the gray field and look up here in the RGB numbers, now if it was really neutral gray, all three of those numbers would be identical. And in this case, they're not. Red is 122, green is 128, and blue is 130. So clearly this gray actually has a blue cast. And let's check out the white. Well, okay, not particularly white. If it was truly white, white, it would be 255 all the way across. And we can see up here the red is 246, the green is 244, and the blue is 250. So again, we have a blue cast in our highlight. And how about the black point? Well, again, it's not actually zero black, it's 038. So again, we have a blue cast. So this is something that you're not going to see in the histogram. It doesn't tell you anything about the nature of, you know, what these colors are. It just sort of indicates statistically that most of the pixels are in the low part. You can kind of see because they don't line up, we can make, might guess that there's some kind of a discrepancy in, um, in the color because they don't line up into a single point. And uh, as we can see here, yeah, the blue... I would never guess from this reading that blue is the cast. It looks like it, red would be the cast, but in fact, it's uh, it's blue. So, you know, the histogram, just not as precise in meaning as you get from the info panel. Now, if I, you know, we've been looking at this, and, you know, this sort of points out one of the discrepancies of the human visual system. Uh, human beings have white point adaptation. So the longer we stare at this set of squares, the more neutral it looks, when in fact, this is now neutral. I've turned off that top layer, and now we have true neutral. This is 129 all the way across. Uh, that's 255 white, and that's 000 black. So um, info panel, very useful. Now, besides 
testing for neutral, which is very often uh, something we need to find out for our images. Uh, it's also useful for discovering uh, relative brightnesses. So I have a I have an image here. Uh, it's a grayscale image, and I've placed along the bottom. I placed a step wedge of uh, grayscale steps. Now these steps uh, in RGB, you can kind of see. You know, this is zero. That's twenty-seven. This is forty-eight. That's seventy. That's 94. Now, I'm going to show you a little trick here with the info panel that's also very useful, and that's to change the secondary color readout from CMYK to LAB. So now, when we look across here, we have 0. The L, we'll look at it, the L value here. The Z, we have 0. That's 10, 20, 30, 40. There's 50%, 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100% brightness. So the L value will allow you to place a tone in an image along this 10-step scale. And for those old school people, this may remind you a little bit of the uh, Ansel Adams zone system, where we had zone 0 to uh, 10. Uh, and um, you know, we have uh, this, this would be one. In a digital step wedge, I can make these steps absolutely linear. And we're doing this uh, in LAB value. So you can see this is 10%. That's like a zone one. 20% is like zone two. 30% is like zone three, four. There's the middle, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So you can move into the image and, and see, okay, well, his skin tone here, it says 67. That's pretty close to a 7. You know, like a zone 7, which is, uh, which is pretty good for a skin tone. We can look and see, like, the brim of his hat here is 13. That's pretty much like, it's closer to, to I see in this area, it's closer to 20. So that's like a zone 2. So if you know the zone system, you can kind of gauge how light or dark something might print by evaluating the L values. Now, if you really want to get um, a good idea for your own printing purposes, make yourself a step wedge like this. And I have instructions for this uh, on my website. If you sign up for my email list, I'll send you a PDF that shows you how to create this. Um, but here we have the st same step wedge, you know, uh, the 10 steps up here at the top, progressing in 10% increments, and you see it's numbered. Underneath it, I have a, a 20 step wedge, so it's uh, the same thing progressing in, uh, in like 5% increments, and then below that is a 40 step wedge. So down here at the bottom, I've indicated where um, the RGB levels, and I, I, I have this uh, for sRGB here, um, if you create this step wedge in LAB and then convert it into the workspace that you want to use, you can print this and then look on this image in, in, in the print and decide where the last clear demarcation before it drops into black, where that actually prints. And very often you'll find that you know, on most papers, especially um, especially matte papers, you'll get up to about 16 here and you won't see the difference between this patch and the next darker patch. Um, if you have you know, a really good profile and glossy paper, you might be able to see this step right in here. But almost, you know, it's, it's not usually the case where you, can, I, where you can separate a level of nine from zero. These two squares almost always print the same level of black and again, like I say for most matte papers, these three squares would print the same level of black. <coughs> so what does this mean? It means that if you're going to be correcting an image for print, and we all like to win print competitions and things like that, it's a good idea to know where the maximum black point can be. If I sent the black, set the black point in the image to zero, I would lose up to 16 different levels 
of tone uh, of information. So instead of setting my black point in the image to zero, I would set it to 16. And then the next point that's just lighter than black would have a chance of reproducing. You know, and the same thing on the on the highlight side, although in general, um, even a level of 247 easily separates from 255 paper white. Uh, but it is useful to set a white point if you um, if you have a white object that you want to have a sense of volume or shape or texture. Probably wouldn't want to send it higher than uh, 245 to be conservative. So I usually set 16 for my black point, 245 for the white point. But here on the step wedge, you can print this out and see for yourself where those limits would be for you and your printer. Um, so let's um, let's see. Let's take a look at let's look at this one. This is a kind of a more standard. Uh, um, landscape image it's got a, a highlight which, what I was particularly this was taken leaning out the car window as I was driving by and um, what I'm interested in here is this highlight and I can see by the L value that that you know and again if you want to make sure that you set your color sampler or here the eyedropper the sample size is set to five by five depending on the resolution of your image, 5x5 five five or 11x11. 11 11. Um, if you have a higher res sensor, I would set it to 11x11, 11 11, but at a minimum, 5x5 five five pixel averaging so that, that you don't get a point. The, the default in Photoshop is point sample, and, and you never know, you know, it kind of wiggles around a lot. You never know if you're sampling a, point, a piece of noise or what, so you want to have that set at 5x5. Five get an average for that area underneath the cursor. And I, I can read that area and look and see right away it says 232, 232, 233. Well, it's it's not very close to white. Now, my black point, I, I'm guessing that I want to set it here. And, uh, you know, I could set any number of things here to be black, but I'd like this darker part of this mountain to really fall into black. And I can see that it's 30, 26, 27. That's has an L value of 10. So um, it could probably go a bit lower. You know, again, um, if I set the black point to uh, something above, uh, say, uh, 6 or 16 pixels, uh, 16 levels, um, then I, I know that that's my maximum black point. So I'm going to say, I'll say 15. That's what I usually set. So I'm looking here 30, 26, 27, and that's not close to 13 or 15. Um, and it shows me an L value of 10. So I know it's not, you know, I could go lower than a zone one to get that to be black. I don't necessarily want to go all the way to zero, but I can see at a glance here, just by checking some things out, that um, my range hasn't been maximized, even though it looks okay. Again, uh, in Photoshop, we can be much more precise. So I'm gonna go ahead and select now from the eyedropper, I'm gonna select the color sample tool, and I'm actually gonna place a point right there on that. That's, a, that's an important highlight for me. And I'm gonna say, this is the important shadow value. And I'll put a curve up. And let's let's start by making the black point darker. And uh, let's see here, uh, 31, 26, 29. So I'd like that really to read um, uh, 15, 15, 15. So right now it's kind of on the blue side. So let's see, I'm gonna move this over until the, the highest value is in the red, uh, the lowest value is in the green channel. So I'm just gonna move it over to till the RGB endpoint makes the green channel 15. Uh, then we'll go over and we'll nudge the blue over as well. And I can use the arrow keys on the keyboard since it's really close. I'll nudge that over a couple points. And uh, we'll nudge the red over until it says 15 as well. So now I've set the black point. It looks like uh, the next lighter value is really by the L value up there. This This area here only is it's really close to to 10% or an L value of 1. So I'd really like that to be a little more separation there. It'd give me a little more shadow detail. So I'm going to take my little hand tool 
and click on that point to place a point on the curve where this, this tone lives, and I'm going to nudge it up. And I'll just leave my cursor there and look at the, the numbers up here, the L numbers and the RGB numbers. And I just want to see that L value go up a little bit, maybe get it closer to, uh, to an L value of uh, 20. We'll, we'll say it's something like that. That's, that's much closer, right? So looking at... Uh, I'm going to look at the image here, like go into full screen mode so I can move the image over. So I'm looking in this area. Let's toggle the, the, the curve on and off. So I've sort of made more contrast in this area and all by using the numbers. OK, so now let's let's check on the uh, the white point, this little highlight value over here. So right now it says 243, 243, 244. Um, since we elevated this one black point, it has raised that point just a little bit, but I'm going to nudge it even more. Um, so we're going to take this, we'll make it hit 247, because I know that there should be maybe some texture there. Uh, it's a small value. Maybe we'll make it closer to 250. I think uh, that's pretty good there. Um, it looks like you know, the blue, if we really wanted to neutralize that, I'd nudge that back down. So now we've got 250 straight across. And our black point, let's go back and nudge that red channel just to, again. Here's a little tip for the curves. And I'll do another rant about the curves uh, in a little more detail. But if you hit a plus or minus, you can toggle between the points on the curve. So now I'm back down to that black point, And I, I'm just going to nudge it just because I'm obsessive compulsive. Uh, I'll nudge it until it says 22. OK, so I hope that makes sense for you. And uh, let's take a look at the toggling it on and off. And essentially, I've just I've elevated and raised and put a little contrast in the lower value all by looking at the numbers. And this maximized the range. This will print much better. And you know, while we're, we were looking at it, this really didn't seem so bad. But when you analyze the numbers, it gives you a leg up on deciding how to proceed with your image enhancement. OK, that's it for today's rant. I hope you've seen how the info panel can be quite useful. You might be interested in a more thorough exploration of color correction by the numbers, which you can find in my Portrait Retouching for the Artistically Challenged course on my uh, online school. Post your comments and suggestions for, the, for new rants uh, below the video, and I'll see you in the next Photoshop rant. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Photoshop Rant. You might be interested in more detailed information on my website, and you might consider following me on YouTube and Twitter to find out about my various classes and workshops. Be sure and like the video, and please, Subscribe to my channel on YouTube. You might consider following me on Instagram. And I have two books in print, available on Amazon in Kindle as well as paperback versions, Mastering Exposure and the Zone System for Digital Photographers, and my bestseller, Skin, The Complete Guide to Digitally Lighting, Photographing, and Retouching Faces and Bodies. I also have a very detailed discussion of my backup strategies in my ebook, Quick Before They're Gone, A Photographer's Guide to Backup, available on Amazon and directly from my website. If you're looking for more in-depth Photoshop tutorials, I have a number of video courses available from my online school at courses.veras.com. Thank you for watching. Post your questions and suggestions for topics to explore under the video, and I'll see you in the next Photoshop rant.